um, they called 20, the year 2020 the year of autocratization. Um, and so we're now in this period of of democratic decline, not just in kind of fledgling democracies, relatively new democracies, but for the first time, we're seeing the most liberal democracies like the United States and the UK decline as well. Yeah, so that begs the question, why the heck did democratization peak and then reverse? Well, that's the million dollar question. And everybody, of course, um, would like to answer that. Um, The biggest theory out there is it has something to do with the rise of the internet and social and unregulated social media. Wow. Um, uh, And if you look which regions, for example, um, had democratic decline last, um, it correlates with internet penetration. Um, No. so, So as internet, the internet penetrated different regions of the world, they penetrated the wealthier regions first, um, and uh, it, in countries where people relied most heavily on on social media, in particular Facebook, for their news source, their main news source, um, that's where you began to see um, uh, democracies weaken and people's trust in democracy decline. This week on Forward, best-selling author of How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them, political science professor Barbara Walter joins Forward to talk her new book. It is my pleasure to welcome to the Forward podcast the New York Times best-selling author of How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them, Professor at UC San Diego, Barbara Walter. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. You have been making the rounds. This book has definitely struck a chord. How has your experience been talking to people about it? Are folks receptive? Are they like, yes, this is totally something to be concerned about? Has there been uh, an ideological breadth uh, or a variance in terms of how people respond to your book? So I've been spending the last three years alone in a, in a dark office, um, not really talking to anybody, just just typing away. And anybody who's written a book knows that as you're doing this, you you really have no idea what the reception is going to be, especially when you're somebody like me, who's an unknown academic, a social scientist, an egghead, who's writing on a really tough, um, frightening subject. Uh, You know, the assumption is, is, is probably that, that nobody's going to want to read it. And, and so when it, When I started, it it started to gain attention before it was even released. I was surprised. And then, of course, it just exploded. And and that's fantastic. I was hoping the message would get out there, but it's completely unexpected. And and then when it started to blow up, I really was worried um, about the reception. Would it be positive? Would it be negative? Would I get a lot of death threats? And really, until yesterday, it was unbelievably positive. And that gave me such hope um, for, you know, where America is today. So not only were people, you know, uh, open to the idea, they wanted this information, they were engaging with the information, but they, I got hundreds and hundreds of emails just thanking me for, for writing it. And the, and the, the message I was getting was, was very consistent. It was, you know, Americans who love their country, who who feel like something's going wrong, who feel like something's building, but they don't really understand it. They don't really know how to think about it. And they all said, you know, the book just gave them a, a framework for for beginning to understand. It was excellent at providing a framework, which I enjoyed as a math guy. There were numerical scales for everything. <laughs> so when you said until yesterday... <laughs> You know, I I really kind of thought I was in the safe zone. You know, this is three months into the the media uh, blitz, and and it's been so positive. And then yesterday afternoon, I just started getting emails, more emails than I've gotten on any single day. And it was overwhelmingly negative. A lot of it was um, 
very personal attacks. A lot of it was um, just diatribes about the left. Um, and I and some of it were, were death threats. And, and it was for the, the first time since the book was released that I was actually a little bit scared where I thought, ooh, this is, you know, this is not good. But And I didn't understand why it was happening. Um, I had done an interview a few weeks ago with the Washington Post, um, and the Washington Post published that interview yesterday. But I've there's been lots of articles in the Washington Post. I've published there myself. It's never elicited this response. And then I realized that all the emails were coming from people who um, read the the interview, not at the Washington Post, but on Yahoo News. And and so it was so interesting that this one media venue um, was hitting a, a very different type of audience um, that was incredibly angry. Um, uh, they hadn't read the book uh, and they they were angry at the interview. They were angry about what I said. And then I went back and read the interview just to make sure that there wasn't anything that I had said that was twisted or or sure. or um and and it was it was not it was a very reasonable interview where I talked about many of the things I talked about in the book. Um, I was careful not to not to you know be alarmist, and it just had this completely different reaction with this particular audience. Well, that that was my immediate response when you described that scenario, which is oh, what happened was it got published to. Uh, generally conservative right-leaning audience who yeah. took umbrage uh, and, and it, it, it's it's an experience I've had in different yeah. ways you know like uh, you speak to the same message to different groups and you get a very very different response um, now this is not something that you just studied for this book you literally spent decades studying civil wars uh, including in Africa in Asia you personally, been in dangerous situations. How the heck does one embark on that as an academic career? So it, it's doubly interesting because my parents were immigrants and my mother came from Switzerland, which is this neutral country, um, a peace-loving country. And and that really has informed all of my research. Um, I'm, I went to graduate school. I started studying civil wars because the thing I care about the most is peace. That's what I want. That's the problem that I want to solve. And the reason I studied civil wars as opposed to interstate wars is that um, civil wars actually kill significantly more people on average than interstate wars. They last significantly longer than interstate wars. They are much, much harder to end which, once they start. Um, and um, unlike interstate wars, they are tend to be fought to the death. They don't tend to end in negotiated settlement. So, so as somebody whose whose main mission is to reduce violence in the world, um, I gravitated towards civil war because they are um, one of the, the the biggest problems we have related to violence, um, and that's been true for the last hundred years. You got some new data about civil wars, or I suppose the entire field got some new data about civil wars um, relatively recently. I think there was a sense that democracy was winning uh, for a particular period of time. And then the, over the last, gosh, uh, 15 to 20 years or so, it seems like it's been backsliding the other direction. So big picture, is that correct? Uh, and what was this new data set that you and other researchers recently had access to in terms of civil conflicts? One of the amazing things about um, the study of civil wars is that there's so much data that we have on it, on everything from why they start to why they last as long as they last, um, who gets targeted, what are the goals, how many people get killed. Um, and in order to understand those big patterns, um, people have been collecting data on everything that they think could influence civil wars. And of course, one of the things that people have thought could in influence civil wars is the type of government that countries have in place. It, you know, whether it matters that you're a democracy or an autocracy or you're something in between. And there's actually at least five big nonprofit organizations around the world that collect data on countries and measure how democratic or autocratic they are. And they do this every year and it goes back, some of them go back to the late 1700s. So we have this wealth of data. 
And all of those data sets have been showing um, two big patterns. The first is that the 20th century was the, the century of democ democratization. It was this, it, it was amazing how democracy was, was growing and spreading around the world. Um, at the beginning of, of the 1900s, um, there were very few democracies around the world. And by the end of the 1900s, a majority of countries were democratic and it showed no indication that this was going to reverse. And, and all of us who study democracy were incredibly hopeful. We, we thought, oh, all we have to do is wait. As countries become wealthier, um, their citizens are going to demand more rights, and eventually all countries in the world will be democratic. And then it ended. 2010 was the peak of democracy around the world, and since 2010, the number of democracies in every region um, has been consistently declining. And that's been happening every single year um, to the point where one of the big organizations that measures democracy, it's called V-DEM, it's a Swedish organization. Um, they called 20, the year 2020 the year of autocratization. Um, and so we're now in this period of of democratic decline, not just in kind of fledgling democracies, relatively new democracies, but for the first time, we're seeing the most liberal democracies like the United States and the UK decline as well. Yeah, so that begs the question, why the heck did democratization peak and then reverse? Well, that's the million dollar question. And everybody, of course, um, would like to answer that. Um, the biggest theory out there is it has something to do with the rise of the internet and social and unregulated social media. Wow. Um, uh, and if you look, um, if you look to see um, which regions, for example, um, had democratic decline last, um, it correlates with internet penetration. Um, no. So, so as internet, the internet penetrated different regions of the world, they penetrated the wealthier regions first. Um, and uh, it, in countries where people relied most heavily on, on social media, in particular Facebook, for their news source, their main news source, um, that's where you began to see um, uh, democracies weaken and people's trust in democracy decline. Um, the most interesting case is Africa. Um, Africa as a continent continued to democratize until 2019. That was after every other continent was, ex was, was experiencing democratic decline and everyone was sort of scratching their heads. Uh, Africa is not known uh, to be you know, uh, a, a continent where, where democracies have an easy time growing and yet it was persevering there in a way that it wasn't persevering anywhere else. And if you looked at, um, at countries with the lowest internet penetration rate, um, North Korea is the the uh, is is the last country. It has the least internet penetration, and the next ten countries are all in Africa. So Africa was insulated um, from from social media as a tool by which anti democratic. Um, players, wannabe autocrats, um, could begin to slowly um, uh, gain support. And, and then once you had a majority of people um, getting their news from social media on that continent, um, starting in 2019, you started to see um, democratic decline there as well. Again, we don't have solid evidence for this. Um, that's there. That's um, people who study this, that's their main hunch. Um, and it is one of the reasons why scholars have been pushing very, very hard for, for companies like Facebook to release their data, to make their data transparent, because until they do that, um, we, we have no hard evidence um, that social media, and in particular, the recommendation engines that are, that are pushing particularly incendiary material, are driving a whole host of negative societal outcomes. It sounds like there's a remote village somewhere that doesn't have internet that's 
a thriving democracy. <laughs> I mean, that's what it sounds like. Oh, I wish uh, it was that easy, right? <laughs> it's more complicated than that. But but that you know, unregulated social media makes it easy for for those who want to undercut democracy. And Putin's been a master of this um, um, throughout. Yeah, Central Western Europe, the United States. Um, he was in, involved in the Brexit debate. Um, you know, the CIA revealed that he was it, he had meddled in our 2016 elections. It is his main tool um, for weakening liberal democracies, which he sees as his main enemy. Well, it, it makes sense to people. It sounds like there's a statistical correlation, but it also makes sense that the decline of institutional trust would go hand in hand with social media and internet adoption spiking because then you can have any point of view, any conspiracy theorist, and the more incendiary yeah. your point of view, the, the more likely you are to gain attention yes. because of the algorithms. Uh, yes. So let, let me just say that relationship makes perfect sense to me and it probably makes perfect sense to most people uh, watching or listening to this, uh, that we imagine that the internet would be a positive force for democracy, but it looks like it has been the opposite. Yes, and and uh, you know, I, I, everybody was 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 thrilled with the internet initially in terms of of you know what people were calling people power that it was going to make it easier for citizens to organize, um, to have their voices heard. Um, if if they were unhappy with their government and they wanted to mobilize a peaceful protest, the internet makes it easy to do that. Um, but if but at the time, um, we didn't know that things like the like button and the share button were, were going to be um, invented. We didn't know that recommendation engines were going to be designed um, uh, with with the goal of maximizing people's engagement online, their time online. We didn't know that the material that human beings, because of the way our brains are wired, um, that human beings would spend much more time on the more negative information, um, the more um, uh, emotive information um, that 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 created feelings of rage um, and and hate and fear. Um, people engage with that ma material far more than than material that is calming and 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 that makes you feel feel happy and, and good. And, and because of that, they get fed more and more of that yes. material. And, and, and that has the effect of, of heightening tensions, heightening fear, and dividing societies. And of course, we didn't know this at the beginning of the internet, because the internet wasn't originally, it didn't have these features. Well, it, it, in your book, you point out that this is a product of the business model, which is maximizing engagement and, and yeah. ad revenue. Uh, and that also is something that I think most people hear, sense, uh, yeah. and live every day. You know, in the press, they talk about small businesses and how we have to protect small businesses. And it's annoying because nothing about our business or most people who own a small business, nothing about that feels small. A small business can be millions of dollars in revenue. And when you're running a small business, time is money, which is why I want to talk to you guys about stamps.com because stamps.com saves us money all the time. You don't waste time with either repeated trips to the post office or waiting in line or skipping the nonsense. It lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process so you can spend less time at the post office and more time making your customers happy, which is why we love it. For more than 20 years, stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses like ours. So whether you're sending invoices or you got a side hustle Etsy shop or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, stamps.com will make your life easier. You just go online, print out your stamps when you need to mail something, and bang, you can take care of all your shipping needs without having to go to the post office. So. We want you to stop overpaying for shipping with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code YANG for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale with no long-term commitments or contracts. So just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code YANG. Check it out, guys. I think you'll like it. So you talk about uh, autocracies and democracies. And I love this because you had a numerical scale that you didn't invent 
or devise is the polity scale. Uh, but it's minus 10 to 10, with minus 10 being complete autocracy. So that's North Korea. Uh, and then you have plus 10 is pure democracy. So that's uh, Canada or Sweden yeah. or something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. Now, America was a plus 10 until relatively recently. Yeah. So what the yeah. heck happened? The polity scale is really important because um, I, I worked on this task force run by the U.S. government from 2017 to the end of 2021. And our job was to come up with this predictive model that helped. Um, where the, else will there be conflict? Not here, where but where else? Conflict. Well, we were absolutely not allowed to look at the United States. That was verboten. But um, we looked everywhere else. And, and we discovered that countries that had two features um, were, were at high risk of civil war um, if, they, if those features continued. And one was anocracy, which came from the polity scale. And anocracy are, are governments that are neither fully democratic nor fully autocratic. They're actually between negative five on the polity scale and positive five. So they're this middle zone. And what we discovered was that full democracies, the, you know, the Swedens and the Canadas, they almost never experience civil wars. And full autocracies, the North Koreas and the Saudi Arabias, rarely experience civil wars. The violence happens uh, almost always in this middle zone. So the middle, this middle zone is the danger zone for, for reasons you know, that we could talk about if people are interested. But, but it's important to know um, that, that that's where the violence and the political instability happens. Um, and the United States, as you said, Andrew, was a positive 10 for much of its history. And then in 2016, uh, the nonprofit organization that that runs the polity scale that that measures um, how democratic or or authoritarian a country is every year, they downgraded the United States from a positive ten to a positive eight, and they did that for a number of reasons. But the, one of the more important reasons was that international election observers who were here in 2016 to observe our elections, they deemed it free but not entirely fair. And it wasn't entirely fair in part because of partisan meddling at the local level um, <clears throat> in terms of, of uh, voting, but also because um, you know the CIA, our intelligence agencies, had discovered uh, that Russia had successfully meddled um, via the internet, via disinformation campaigns, in the elections as well. Um, and so we were downgraded to positive eight. Um, the, the Center for Systemic Peace downgraded the United States once again in 2019. And it did this because um, we had a, a president and an executive branch that was refusing to respond um, uh, to demands for information from Congress and refuse to respond to subpoenas. And that might not seem like a big deal, but the way our founding fathers designed our democracy was um, uh, through a series of checks and balances. And the main check on presidential power, uh, the main check on the executive branch is the legislative branch. And if you have an executive branch and a president who refuses to comply with any requests or demands by the main check on its power, then that indicates that the executive branch is significantly more powerful and is essentially running roughshod um, over the legislature. Um, and so we were downgraded again. And then by the end of the Trump administration, by the end of 2020, we were downgraded to a positive five. Um, and that's the first time the United States was there since 1800. And that meant that the United States by this measure was considered an anocracy. Um, uh, and so in, in, by the end of 2020, the US lost its position as the world's longest standing democracy. Previous to that, we were the oldest democracy in the world. And now that honor goes to Switzerland. 
And the reason that um, the U.S. was downgraded at the end of 2020 was because we had a sitting president, again, in the executive branch, which is now more powerful than any other branch. We had a president who was refusing to accept the results of an election and was actively trying to overturn it. Um, uh, so that's where we're at the end of 2020. We are now back at a positive eight. Um, we got upgraded, but not to a positive 10. We got upgraded um, when there was actually a peaceful transfer of power. Um, and when the new president um, uh, was showed that he was going to follow the rule of law. So that's where we are today. So the danger zone by this scale is between plus five and minus five. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people don't believe that this particular storm has passed uh, at, at this point. Sixty five percent of Republicans yeah. believe yes. that the last election was not legitimate. Uh, that's about 30 percent of the population. Um, so. The studies uh, around causes of conflict, uh, I found this fascinating. A lot of people know I ran for president uh, and one of the, well, they know I ran for president, but they know I ran for president on this idea of a transforming economy yeah. and that the economic uh, forces were going to push and are, have already pushed many, many Americans to the sidelines. And I believe that this was going to be something that was uh, going to lead to all sorts of political and social yeah. ills. Uh, now, your data shows that uh, that is something of a precondition where if, if people yeah. are immiserated, uh, then uh, it can lead to conflict. But that that poverty is not the main factor, yeah. though, nor is even inequality, which I think is going to be counterintuitive to a lot of people, yeah. because that that's what you imagine uh, is a precursor to conflict. Um, instead, you pose that uh, it's the formation of factions. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that the task force found that two, two factors in particular were highly predictive. The first was whether a country whether a country's government was an anocracy or not. And the second factor was whether in those anocracies, citizens had organized themselves um, into political parties that were based on ethnicity, religion, or race, as opposed to any political ideology. So you didn't have socialist parties and liberal parties. You, you had a Serb party, a Croat party, or a Muslim party and a Christian party. Um, uh, those were the countries that were particularly combustible. Um, and those, those types of parties, um, um, tended to want to rule at, to the exclusion of, of everyone else. So we called them predatory parties. They, they organized along identity and then they sought to gain political power, not only to rule, but to shut everybody else out of power. Um, and so in some ways they were anti-democratic parties. And we know, um, you know, we know that one of the motivations for groups to want to rebel um, is if they feel they are shut out of power. So it's political exclusion that really motivates people much more than poverty or inequality. And, and actually, it makes sense um, because you can be poor, but if your group has political representation, you have an avenue by which you can help improve your group situation. I'm not saying that it's 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 always successful, but you have a political avenue for change. If you're politically excluded from power and and you're poor, there's nothing you can do. Um, to, at least within conventional politics, to improve your lot. And so it's those groups that, that sometimes turn um, to, to violence as, as a means of affecting change. So, so it's this notion that, that there's no way you're ever going to have representation in power um, that, that really seems to galvanize people to organize and to turn to violence. So a faction along ethnic lines is the most dangerous. Uh, and in your book, you talk about Yugoslavia and other yeah. societies that have experienced a version of this. Uh, you refer to a political leader who activates this kind yeah. of party as an ethnic entrepreneur, which I found fascinating. Um, uh, that's probably a term of art where this, this isn't something that... <laughs> that, that uh, 
uh, that you you came up with. No. Um, but but you describe <laughs> Trump as in in many ways the ultimate ethnic entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. So ethnic entrepreneur is an old political science term. Um, and it you it refers to individuals and they're usually politicians, but they can be business leaders. They can actually be church leaders. They can be Internet personalities. Um, but usually you see um, ethnic entrepreneurs emerge um, in politics. And um, the term exists because you have these individuals who at certain times um, and it's usually times of transition when when uh, citizens are going through usually um, some sort of change. And it could be a demographic change. It could be, a, you know, an economic crisis. It could be a technological transformation. So times of change um, tend to make average citizens um, uncertain Feel, they tend to make them feel a little bit insecure. Um, and that's actually fine. People can weather these, these times. We've all gone through them ourselves. But ethnic entrepreneurs are individuals who see these times as opportunities for them to um, try to grab political power by preying on this fear and, and insecurity. And they often use ethnicity as a way to galvanize support. And I think the best way to illustrate this is to talk about, um, you know, one of the classic ethnic entrepreneurs who is Slobodan Milosevic. Um, he was an old time communist in the former Yugoslavia. He'd been a member of the Communist Party. He'd been in power because he was a good communist. And then the Soviet Union collapsed and Yugoslavia was allowed to pick whatever political system it had. And Yugoslav citizens decided that they wanted to democratize. And they very quickly organized um, real competitive elections. And here you have Milosevic, who very much wants to stay in power. Um, but he knows that Yugoslavs don't like communists and they know and he knows that they know that he's a communist. And so if he runs as a communist, there's no way he's going to win, um, that he's going to be able to compete effectively. So he's very savvy and he's very strategic. And he realizes that the biggest ethnic group in Yugoslavia are the Serbs. They had the greatest numbers. Um, and he was a Serb. So he began to just pump out this narrative. He controlled, he was able to control state radio, he was able to control state television, and he continuously um, broadcast this message that during these uncertain times, Serbs had to band together um, and they had to form their own party and they had to follow a strong Serb leader because if they didn't do that, the Croats were going to do that. And if the Croats did that and they, they got into power instead of the Serbs, then they were going to kick Serbs out of their jobs, kick them out of the military, and possibly kill them like some Croats had done during World War II. And this message really resonated during this time when, when Yugoslavs were, when, were, were looking around and, and not really sure how, how this new state was going to play out. And they were worried and they followed Milosevic and he understood that 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 playing on ethnicity and identity and people's fear and insecurity um, could be a powerful motivator for them to get behind him and that's really what an ethnic entrepreneur is yeah, and, and that wound up in a conflagration of uh, of tragic and terrible proportions yes. uh, with uh, you know, Yugoslavia being torn apart by civil war. And, yeah. Uh, uh, was that termed a genocide or an ethnic cleansing? It was the first time the term ethnic cleansing was used. And it, it was a conscious policy by the Serbs. Um, the Croats did it to a certain extent as well. But but the Serbs did it um, uh, more widely. Um, their goal was to um, move Croats out of Serb areas and then especially in in Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, where you had a large um, 
Croat and Muslim population uh, to especially move um, uh, the Muslims out, uh, both by killing them um, and by uh, uh, chasing them out out of the region and and forcing them to flee. And of course, most of them never returned. Um, and so it was a success, successful strategy of, of radically changing the demographics um, of certain regions of that country. So a faction along ethnic lines is particularly dangerous, uh, and sometimes it can be combined with other factors like where people live yeah. to form a super faction. And one of the consistent threads in Yugoslavia and other places is an urban-rural divide. Yeah. Uh, so here in the U.S., it obviously calls to mind rural whites uh, lining up behind Donald Trump yeah. uh, as uh, super faction, if you will. Yeah. So the more types of identities or, or how do I want to say, um, a line in one party, um, the, the, in some ways, the more dangerous it, it is. And so super factions are particularly dangerous. And, and it's when you have a party based on race or ethnicity, but also based on the same religion, and then also based on the same geographic location. Um, and in Serbia, you had, um, you know, they were, you know, the, the Serb party was was all Serbs. Um, they were all um, the particular type of Christianity that Serbs were, and they were all predominantly uh, rural dwellers, not not city dwellers. Um, and um, and and they were the ones who then went after um, the the more urban, uh, you know. First they went after the Bosnian Muslims, and then then they or well, actually in Croatia they went after the Croatians first, and then in Bosnia Bosnia they went after the Bosnian Muslims first, um, who were predominantly living in the cities like Sarajevo. Uh, so I, I have to say this narrative uh, definitely leads one to very dark parallels uh, in in terms of the U.S. Uh, you know, another factor that you cite current. Uh, that recurs globally is a loss of status where you feel like you were on the uh, inside and then you're on the outside, either politically or culturally or economically. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, the whole reason I, I wrote this book was, was, you know, I'm on this task force. I'm sitting in different conference rooms outside of DC. We're talking about all these countries around the world, we know what the model predicts. We know that the, the model is actually quite good at predicting where instability and violence is. And, and I'm seeing the same factors emerge here in the United States. And it was shocking to, to me to, to see so many parallels. You know, we've been talking about ethnic entrepreneurs long before Donald Trump emerged. And of course, he is also a classic uh, uh, ethnic entrepreneur. We also know who tends to start these um, ethnic civil wars. And we have there's an old term for that as well. We call them sons of the soil. Um, and sons of the soil are groups um, and they can they can be uh, the you know the dominant group in a country as a whole or they could be the dominant group in a region. But sons of the soil are are ethnic groups that um, believe that they are the the um, rightful heirs to a country. They believe that um, the identity of the that 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 the identity of the country should reflect their ethnicity, their religion. They believe that they should always be in power because they had been in power, they are in power or had been in power in the past. Um, and they're the ones who tend to start civil wars if they see their grip on power um, fading or if they actually lose um, their majority status because demographics have have changed and and what seems to be motivating them again it's not poverty these these 10 these are not the poorest groups in society but it's this deep 
sense of um, resentment at the loss of status, um, where they, they truly believe this is our country. We deserve to be in power in our country. Nobody's going to take that away from us. And, and we're going to fight for our country. And it's, it's our right and it's our duty to do that. And so, you know, I've studied Sons of the Soil for, for decades. And, and then, you know, January 6th happened and, and you're watching, you're watching the same, um, the, the same feelings um, being broadcast here were, you know, mostly white men um, marching with impunity down the mall, um, taking videos of themselves, breaking into the Capitol. Um, and they truly believed that they were being patriots. Um, you know, they did not think what they were doing was illegal. They certainly didn't think it, it was potentially treasonous. They thought it was there. Um, their duty to take their country back. And that is a classic sons of the soil feeling. And, and it's, if, if they're unsuccessful in taking their country back, um, then um, the more extreme elements of those sons of the soil group, um, you know, often organize and they're the ones who start these wars. Uh, so there is a scale for factionalism as well. I was thrilled to see it. Uh, apparently, it's a five-point scale. Yeah. And right now, the United States is at a three. Is that accurate? Yeah, and three is where – three indicates that you have um, ethnic factions. Yes. Uh, there is also – and this is a very dark thing, but uh, I believe it's something like a violence or genocide scale, yeah. uh, which was a 10-point scale. And on that, the United States is at roughly a five. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, these are out there. Your listeners can can Google um, all of this and it's all public access and they can read about it. But, um, you know, it's so surprising when you read this, <clears throat> the 10 steps to genocide um, is um, first how the early the early steps, you know, a could appear quite innocent um, so that people really don't know that they're moving up the steps as it's happening. And, and you've probably heard the analogy that people have been, been using, and they use this oftentimes with the rise of fascism. It's it's like the frog in, in the water, right? Um, um, where somebody turns up the heat and, and it, you know, the frog doesn't even realize that things are getting worse um, until it's until it's too late. Um, and it's, it's oftentimes similar with ethnic cleansing or, or genocide, that the early stages of it seem... Um, quite innocent. And oftentimes it's portrayed to the public as these are necessary steps that need to be taken to protect people, right? So one of the steps is is identification, where people are, you know, are asked to have ID, ID cards. Um, and, you know, people are told this is really, this is to protect you. Um, and so people get I, ID cards. But of course, one of the reasons why ID cards um, or, or why, why, um, leaders will want people to have ID cards is if it's actually difficult to determine who is a Serb or who is a Croat or who is a Jew and who is a German. Um, this is exactly what happened in Rwanda prior to the genocide there where Tutsis and Hutus are indistinguishable. You cannot tell um, the, the difference. And in fact, they're ethnically the same. Um, and so if you're a Hutu and you are losing power, which is what was happening in Rwanda, and you want to prevent Tutsis from coming to power and, and you know, extremists in the Hutu party, they were called the Intahamwe, um, they're the ones who organize the genocide. But one of the things they have to do is try to figure out who the Tutsis are. And so, so years before they required everybody to have ID cards that, that then could tell them um, who, who was Tutsi and who was Hutu. So that's just an example of, and, and you know, these it, seemingly innocent measures um, that slowly build over time until, you know, suddenly people are in a situation where where they're convinced that the other, you know, well, the other side is is almost subhuman and certainly a threat to them and and is a threat to the state and and needs to be either deported or imprisoned or, you know, the extreme case would be killed. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, so you point out that there are uh, extremists on both sides, but that the vast majority of the violence yeah. comes from people associated with the alt-right. I think the percentage was something around 80% yeah, or right. 4 to 1, yeah. uh, which I think most people sense uh, that, that, uh, that there's a higher propensity for instigation and violence uh, from the right. And you, you do paint a picture about what a civil war could look like in the United States, uh, which would not be a civil war in a conventional sense where you have political uh, entities and conventional warfare, but instead you have dozens or hundreds of militias engaging in what most people would consider terrorist yeah. activities. Uh, how many militias are there right now in the U.S.? I think there's over 400. Um so we we were at a, a peak previously in 1996, um, and that's the year that Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City. Um, militias had been growing um, prior to that, and then they declined after Oklahoma City, and they declined because the FBI was quite uh, effective at going after these groups and... Um, and imprisoning their leaders and infiltrating them, but also in part because I think American, the American public was so disgusted by what they saw that it, these, these far right groups had, or these militias had a hard time recruiting. That shifted in 2008. Since 2008, we've seen once again, um, the rise and a rapid rise of militias. Most of it's been on the far right. Uh, the vast majority, or um, I think about 65% of those far right groups are white supremacist groups, about 25% are anti-federal government groups. There's some overlap between the two, but that's what we're seeing on the far right. Now, I get a lot of emails from people saying, well, what about the far left? And what about Antifa? You know, is, you know, are you being biased by only showcasing the right? Um, and my response to that is, you know, there's great data on militias. Um, and we actually know that far left um, uh, militias were the majority in the in the 60s and 70s. So you could think about the Black Panthers. You could think about um, uh, violent environmentalist groups, um, anarchists. Um, so it was the left um, in previous decades that was uh, that was dominant. Um, they have been declining, um, and the far right has been growing to the point where um, you know most of the the violent extremists here in the United States are definitely on on the far right. Antifa exists, um, uh, but it's it's one group. It's it's small and and again in terms of of numbers the numbers of of militias on the far right is much greater so you paint a daunting picture uh people are now picking up on it um uh, in the mainstream and we all owe you a debt uh when you started your book you didn't know that events would then end up essentially verifying uh your thesis uh so you do suggest some solutions so well, one of the facts in your book that really struck me uh is that of the civil wars that occurred in democracies over a multi-decade period, uh, none of them were in proportional democracies. They were all in majoritarian uh, or presidential systems, uh, which the U.S. has. And you present, and I think this is correct, is that, look, people may go through the political system unless they feel yeah. like there's just no hope for them. Uh, and... I'm not sure if you you know, but I, I've started uh, the forward party to try to shift us towards a more yes. dynamic, representative, yes. uh, multi multi party uh, democracy, which I, I think is a must. Uh, what solutions uh, do you think are most vital for us to try and make progress on uh, in the time we have? Because I, I, you know, people also know that I'm. Very, I, I think Trump runs again in 24. I think he wins the Republican nomination. I think he uh, he is a very, very strong bet to win outright. Um, or if he doesn't win outright, say he won. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see uh, a replay of January 6th, but on a, a larger scale. Um, so I, I suppose I just doubled down on the very, uh, you know, dark picture that, that you painted in, in your book. Um, so uh, what are the things that you are most animated about 
in terms of solutions? It sounds like one of them is social media for sure. Well, that would be the easiest solution. It, it, you know, we the U.S. government regulates all sorts of industries that we know uh, could potentially harm American citizens. We we regulate the meat industry. We regulate uh, mainstream media, television, and radio. Um, uh, so we understand um, how powerful uh, a tool media can be and how it could be used. Um, to really tear societies apart. And, and yet here we have this enormous um, uh, media vehicle that is is now dominating everything else. It's, it's bigger it's, than any yes, traditional media it's, vehicle it's at this point. where most people are Orders getting their news and there's no regulation. Yeah. And I actually am not somebody who advocates censoring um, what people put on uh, social media platforms. I think people, for the most part, should be allowed to put whatever they want on these platforms. Free speech, go for it. What I what I don't believe should be allowed is for social media companies to take again the the most divisive, the most extreme, the most um, a, 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 you know uh, incendiary material and give it an enormous audience instantaneously and mag and basically be a megaphone for that information because they know that that information keeps people engaged and keeps them coming back more than information that would be helpful to, to society and um, so the fact that 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 they're allowed to do this and and that there there's no restrictions and we're and we're now in 2022 seeing, you know, many of, of the negative effects. There's all of these trends that have emerged um, since around, you know, the late 2000s, since, you know, 2010, the decline of liberal democracy, the rise of ethnic nationalism, the rise of, of, of hate crimes, the rise of, of um, far right um, uh, extremist groups, um, the rise of a militias, like all of these things are happening at this particular moment in time. And you have to ask yourself, like, what is causing it? And why is it happening now? What has changed to make this possible? And, and, uh, you know, everybody keeps gravitating back to the answer is yes, social media, social media. And, yeah. and, you know, the fact that that there there are no regulations on this despite these really awful outcomes is really um, shocking. It would be at the five biggest tech companies are here in the United States. Um, it would be easy for us to to tamp down this this negative uh, bullhorn. Well, it'd be easy of us if our government was not decades behind uh, uh, the technological yes. understanding curve. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, right now, even when they do have hearings on it, they berate the tech leaders about uh, issues that strike yes, me as marginal. I, I mean, like that, that like, like, like the central problem is that they're profiting to the tune of billions of dollars by an algorithm that uh, accelerates hatefulness, uh, yeah. anger, fear, resentment, and oh, by the way, it's uniquely subject to foreign misinformation. Yes. yes, it's it's the backdoor way that our enemies can undercut our own society. It's you know they can't take on the U.S. military. Um, you know it's hard to infiltrate the U United States in other ways, but boy, it's really easy via the internet, via social media. Yeah, you also recommend, uh, and I agree with this. I agree with just about everything that you you uh, prescribe. Um, that our government has to do better at delivering benefits to various folks, and you, you suggest <clears throat> things like maybe healthcare, yeah. may, maybe <laughs> maybe something that they know um, that that uh, you know is a win for them. Um, I like cash. Uh, that's yeah. one of my preferred mediums. Um, and you, you described this as outbidding, which I found to be a really interesting frame. It was like a political yeah. science term. Um, but that when people are incited to violence, uh, there is like a, a bid for their loyalty yeah. from uh, extremist groups uh, or from ethnic entrepreneurs or whatever. And, and, and you suggest, look, the government can outbid <laughs> these, yes. these other groups. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. It, you know, we didn't have an ethnic faction in this country really until recently. Um, you know, America didn't have racially based parties. Um, as late as 2008, white Americans were equally likely to vote for Democrats as they were to vote for Republicans. But that changed when uh, Barack Obama came to power. And that's when the white working class 
And, and that group had traditionally been supporters of the Democratic Party, and they supported the Democratic Party because the Democrats, the social and the economic policies um, were more aligned with working class interests than the Republican Party's policies. Um, and they began to gravitate towards the Republican Party because the Republican Party was offering other things. Um, they were they were using cultural issues. They were um, playing on on uh, you know fears of of you know changing demographics. So they were offering other things to the white working class. And then the question is, okay, why were they able to do this? And I, and I think one of the answers is. Um, that both the Republican Party, but but the Democratic Party um, also, um, they uh, in, in some ways didn't protect the white working class from the negative effects of globalization. You know, Bill Clinton signed NAFTA. Bill I agree Clinton with that. Signed NAFTA. That that you know, on average, helped um, uh, you know Americans. But there were losers in in the, in NAFTA here in the United States, and that was you know mostly white working class men who who used to have good union jobs um, that you know allowed them to lead um, solid middle class lives, and yes. when those manufacturing jobs left. Um, you know, the Democrats didn't put in place, um, you know, a safety net to, to help that group. Um, and in fact, the, you know, the both parties have been have been, you know, reducing social services over time um, to middle class, working class um, and poor Americans. Um, and, and so there are real grievances out there. Um, but when you think of the sons of the soil um, and these are this is groups that had once been dominant politically and economically. These are these are groups who who enjoyed lots of privileges um, who who are then seeing that their status is declining relative to other groups? I th I think that's what happened. They uh, or on an absolute yes. scale because you know their life expectancy is diminishing. Uh, you know that's not relative. That's uh, it's just yeah. Reality. And you know their their uh, divorce rates are increasing. You know they're they're less likely to own homes. And there's a whole series of social indicators where they have declined. Yes. And Latinos and um, and African Americans, for example, um, you know, at at worst, they've remained steady, and so that that is, you know, building resentment. You know, why are we doing? Why are we doing worse when, in fact, we should be doing better than everybody? And and that's where that you know this this deep sort of anger and resentment comes from. Uh, so you don't say this in the book, um, but I, I'm I'm curious what you think, and I'll just tell you what you know my thoughts on this. Um, I ran for president, and one of the things I found is that our two party system is a really really poor uh, a, a poor system for different points of view uh, being uh, considered, and, and then. Uh, it, it overcompensates in the sense that if you do have one major party, let's say the Republican Party, uh, like, succumb to bad yeah. leadership, then all of a sudden you can slump into authoritarianism very, very quickly. Uh, I, I think the duopoly is the worst design failure in the history of the world and, and that we, we may end up suffering the results. Uh, do you think that if you had, and your research suggests that this is the case, that if you had a representational system, then there's a lower propensity to conflict because people would then have like a, a party that would represent their point of view as opposed to some, some uh, right now you're trying to wedge yourself into the two party system and, and sometimes that doesn't work or sometimes you end up uh dominating and yeah. I, I don't think either of those is is positive yeah so uh, yes i think it would be more representative there it, 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 the things you want to 
you want to avoid when you set up your parliamentary system. One of the decisions you're going to have to make is, um, you know, how, what percent of the vote do you need to get a seat in parliament? And you could require that you win 10 percent of the vote, whatever. Um, Israel had one of the smallest percentages. I think it originally started with you only need one percent and then they moved it to two percent. And wow, it's quite small. small. Yeah. And that actually can lead to a tyranny of the minority because if no if there are now so many parties in parliament or that that no one party can can you know win an outright majority and therefore has to form a coalition it means that you could be a teeny tiny party and and if you help a larger party get over 50%, you can hold that party hostage. So so you you'd want to think sure. about that. There were very good reasons why the founding far, fathers created this two-party system. They were to yeah. Oh no, the, but I mean they they set up mechanisms yeah. that would lead to a two-party system, but they were anti yes. partisan yes. Uh, you know yes. at least on the face I of mean it. the bigger problem Andrew, and you you know this um uh is that our democracy has so many archaic, undemocratic, yep. weird, bizarre yeah. features that no other healthy, strong democracy has. Um, the electoral college, yes. like ask any any person in you know who lives in Europe, in Denmark or or Germany or France, um, and you talk about the electoral system, their head begins to spin. They're just like, what what is this? Um, you know, we have we have the filibuster. We have um, well, that was exactly made up, we, we you know we have <laughs> gerrymandering. We have an executive, you know, you know that's more powerful than every every other um, branch. So so our democracy, I think, is uniquely vulnerable to uh, yeah. backsliding towards authoritarianism, um, you know, especially with this presidential winner take all system that that if you get yes. into power, yes. um, you know, the president with the help of, of members of, of his or her party in Congress can begin to tamper with democracy, our democracy in ways that makes it really hard for the opposition to ever regain control and and in essence to cement in you know the president's party even if it's a minority of of the population and this is exactly of course what the republicans are seeking to do now now that they see that increasingly they don't have the votes to win in a majoritarian system yeah uh, it, it's it's very it's a very dark yeah. time uh and one of the tough part in my opinion of like the flaws of this system is that the presidential election ends up becoming in, in some ways like the sole yeah. release valve which is a terrible right. system <laughs> you, know, you know like, like that, that's like exactly the opposite of what you'd want you you know you'd want differences to be sorted out well before then but like you know be, be because of uh, a number of uh impediments like it's very very hard for people to feel like they're going to be able to make change yeah. in yeah, anything and, except and a, and especially you know level. now you have uh the filibuster where um it's become impossible for um either party really to get anything done and what this does is it undercuts um people's trust in democracy because they see that nothing's getting done they're seeing that nothing is being yep. reformed um and 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 cynicism begins to creep in and and people begin to question yep. whether in fact this is the best system in the world and then of course you have you know want to be autocrats that who who would prefer um to have more power than less power and 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 they continue that narrative you know this the system isn't working or um it's it's rigged against you um and and you know we need to to clean out the swamp or whatever the euphemism ism is but but trust in democracy and support for democracy is declining around the world including here in the united states and and one of the reasons why is is you have you know a system that doesn't appear to be able to to function particularly effectively yes uh, you close your book on a personal story that I, I thought was very uh, brave of you to, to share, honestly, where you and your uh, husband, both children of immigrants, uh, and you saw January 6th unfold and you done the research you were doing and you actually said, you know what, <clears throat> maybe we should get passports to another country yeah. like in, in case things yeah. start going really south, which, uh, you know, I, I will say, I think a lot of Americans have had those thoughts 
how are you feeling now and what are the the thing i mean you've done dozens of these interviews about your very very successful and important book how civil wars start um what have you not had a chance to express in other interviews like <laughs> that, that you know because i, I feel like um and, and our is this uh, arc in uh promoting the book is it making you uh, more optimistic uh, or pessimistic um it's <laughs> you know i i wasn't i wasn't expecting the hundreds of incredibly kind positive supportive grateful emails that i got and and these emails from thoughtful people who clearly love this country and and want to do everything they can um, to put it back on on the right course and um, and that that gave me hope the, the emails from yesterday were were disturbing in, in part because though the people who are writing those seemed unhinged in some ways sort of irrational so incredibly angry, really not capable of of communicating um, beyond. There, there, there's a lot yeah. of pain that is manifesting itself in irrationality and yeah, hate and, and, and anger and darkness. And so you see this enormous yes. divide um, between between. I don't know if it's a left right divide, but or or it's it's a division based on. I, education or I don't know what what that the divide is but so I'm not really answering a question let me how do I feel now no no I mean I mean you know you you just had this experience very recently yeah. obviously yesterday and as someone who has received uh very very hateful negative uh messages like it, it's extraordinarily difficult because you see it and you're like wow um in like that there is so much so anger much and, anger and, yeah and uh, okay i guess that's the story yes. I, I i talk a little bit about it in the book but i not i haven't really done it in interviews i i grew up in just outside of new york city in yonkers new york um but i've lived in california the last 25 years and i've lived in california during its great transformation from a, a state that was majority white to a state that's minority white um and i teach at a university that's 20 20 percent white um the vast majority of my students yeah, the vast majority white. of my Sorry, students are, are not are not white, um, and and I've seen the trajectory, and the trajectory I think is a trajectory that the rest of the country is going to go through, um, and that trajectory is um, you know as as minorities here in California grew in size, the white majority or elements of the white majority felt increasingly threatened, and you had an ethnic entrepreneur. In the in the face of of um, Pete Wilson emerged to run to run for governor, and he ran on a very anti-immigrant platform, and he won on that platform. He he played towards the fears of whites here in California about what would happen to them and to their state if immigrants continued to to uh, come into the the state and so he was his policies were quite brutal towards um uh towards mexicans in particular illegal immigrants he he uh wanted to withhold health care for them education from them no driver's license you know it, it, it was it was brutal and he won the election um and then the latino population continued to increase in California and became the majority. Um, and they never forgave him and the Republican Party for those brutal policies. And and the reason why California is such a solidly blue state today is not because of, of um, you know, people like me, it's it's because of, of Latinos. Um, and, and if you look to see how California is doing today, when we're on the other side of this transition, it's thriving. I, I know the right likes to portray it as, as having all sorts of, of problems, whether it's homelessness or, or other things. It's not a perfect state, but our GDP has, has grown by 200% since, um, uh, since we've, be, you know, since the the transition, there's a whole host of measures where where California is doing um, quite well. And so when I think about this, you know, I think, wow, you know, the other end of this great transformation, which is going to happen by 2045 in the rest of the United States, 
the United States will be a white minority country by around 2045. Uh, and, and whites are terrified or, or, or a subset of whites are terrified about this. But but I think what they need to know is, is wow, you know, we're, we could thrive um, and, and we could uh, as a as a you know a youthful dynamic multicultural multi religious country, um, you know be a model for the rest of the world. And of course, the the rest of of white majority countries are going to be behind the United States. We're going to be the first country to go through this transformation. And so it really is contingent on us um, to show the rest of the world how we do this because it's just it's going to happen. I could not agree with you more that managing this transition is the challenge of this generation and that if we fail in it, we will uh, fall victim to some of the same conflicts that have plagued other societies. I mean, we're not unique uh, or or distinct. Uh, This is it. This is what we have to do together. Uh, Thank you for such uh, an important contribution. How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them. Barbara Walter, newly minted New York Times bestselling author and uh, someone that we could all learn a lot from. I clearly have learned a lot from uh, both sitting with you and reading this book. So thank, thank you, you so Andrew. much, Barbara. It really was an honor to be able to have this time with you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, the honor was all mine. 